Hi. So in this lecture, I'd like to focus in on something called the density of states, okay? And um, for this particular lecture, I'm talking about the density of states for conductions, conduction electrons in um, particularly metals or semiconductors. So in our previous lecture on the Fermi energy, which if you haven't seen, you need to watch that one first, okay? Um, but in our previous lecture on the Fermi energy, we modeled the energy of conduction electrons in a metal as trapped in a three-dimensional infinite square well. Now, um, this 3D infinite square well we can maybe picture um, as having uh, dimensions L, so length L, okay? And remember that for the 3D infinite square well in quantum mechanics, the energy levels can be described as H squared over 8ML squared times the sum of the squares of the quantum numbers in the x, y, and z directions. That's mx squared plus ny squared plus nz squared. And this comes from solving the Schrodinger equation in three dimensions. Here h is Planck's constant, m is the mass. Um, in this particular problem, the mass would be the mass of an electron, and l is the dimension of the well. Now we're going to say that the sum of the squares of the quantum numbers in the x, y, and z directions can sum to some value that we'll call n squared. Okay, so nx squared plus ny squared plus nz squared is equal to n squared, and this is the equation for a sphere. Okay. Now, if you plot um, what that might look like in quantum number space, and that's done over here, um, so here we have the x, y, and z axes here as being the quantum numbers in the x, y, and z. So this is plot of quantum number space. And then you can see that this nx squared plus ny squared plus nz squared is one-eighth of a sphere. And that's because, of course, your quantum numbers can't be negative. So we're just taking this positive quadrant. Now let's say that we want to know the number of electron states. Um, and I'll call that big N sub s. That's up to some threshold value of the energy. E, okay? So what you would do, and this is going back to the previous lecture, is you would find the volume of the sphere in quantum space. And of course this is going to be one-eighth of a sphere. Now the volume of a sphere is four-thirds pi times the radius cubed, right? So for our little sphere that would be n is the radius. So we have four-thirds pi n cubed, but we only have one-eighth of that, so we multiply that times one-eighth. And then we remember that um, an electron can be either spin up or spin down, and you can have a spin up and spin down electron occupying each state. And so that means we multiply by two. Now, if we rearrange this equation and solve for uh, n, little n, then we get little n is equal to three times n sub s over pi to the one-third power. So if I plug that back in to my equation for the energy, okay, then h squared n squared over 8m l squared is equal to h squared over 8m times 3 n sub s over pi l cubed to the 2 thirds, all right? And that's because, of course, 1 over l squared is equal to 1 over l cubed to the 2 thirds power, so you can just move that inside if you'd like. Now, I can rearrange that equation and show with just a little bit of algebra. Now, if you like to keep up with the algebra as I talk, you might want to pause it here, but I'm going to skip ahead because this is a YouTube video, right? So with a little bit of algebra, you can rearrange for the total number of electron states n sub s. And that's 8 pi over 3 times 2 m e to the 3 halves times l cubed over h cubed. And that means that if I divide both sides by l cubed, I get the number of electron states per unit volume. And that's n sub s over l cubed, which is equal to 8 pi over 3 h cubed times 2 m e to the 3 halves. So this is our expression of the number of electron states per unit volume. But what's the density of states? Okay, I'm getting to that. Well, taking our expression for the number of states per unit volume, if I take the derivative of that expression with respect to energy, then what I would have is the number of states per unit volume per unit energy. And that's the density of states. So I'm going to call the density of states, it's a function of the energy, so I'm going to call that big D sub s, function of E, right? And then that's the derivative of the expression here on our first line, n sub s over L cubed. So I'm going to take the derivative of that with respect to the energy. 
Now this 8 pi over 3 h cubed and the 2m to the 3 halves, those are all constants, so I can pull that out front. And then I would just have the derivative of e to the 3 halves, which would of course be, you know, 3 halves e to the 1 half. Simplifying with some um, algebra, what I end up with is 8 pi over h cubed, m to the 3 halves, times the square root of 2e. Now yet again, there's a little bit of algebra, so if you want to pause and take a look at that, you go right ahead. I've triple checked it though. Okay, so that's our expression for the density of states. 8 pi over h cubed, m to the 3 halves, times the square root of 2 times the energy. Now, this is the number of states, number of states is dimensionless, right, per unit volume, per unit energy. So that makes the units 1 over joules times meters cubed, or joules to the minus 1, meters to the minus 3. Now, this is a little hard to wrap your head around. So in the book, a um, little plug for the book here, Nanotechnology Understanding Small Systems, which is one of the textbooks for our course, um, you can see here they have an analogy in it to uh, an apartment building. And so what they're saying is, they're saying, okay, picture a solid as an apartment building, and the volume of the apartment building would be akin to the volume of the solid, all right? So if you wanted to think of the density of states and kind of picture it in terms of what's going on in this apartment building, it's analogous to the density of apartments on different stories of the building, okay? So in this case, you think of the apartments as the state, okay? So the apartment is kind of the energy state here. And it's in a building, which is akin to the volume of the solid. And the stories in the building, what floor you're on, that's the energy, okay? So apartment is to state, energy is to floor, volume of apartment building, volume of solid. And so each apartment is a place that a person, which is akin to an electron here, can occupy. And so let's say that maybe the uh, how nice and big the apartments are, uh, kind of changes as you go up in floors. That's sort of the idea here. Now this is reverse. Usually the penthouse is the most expensive, okay? But in our analogy, the most expensive apartments are going to be on the ground floor, right? So you can be near your car, I guess. I don't know. So you're on the ground floor, right? You don't have to walk up as many steps. You get a big spacious apartment. But as you go up in floors, the apartments get smaller and smaller. And so you can pack more and more apartments into that floor. And that's what's going on with the density of states. Because as the energy increases, the density of states increases as the square root of the energy. So it's an ever-increasing function, and the number of states goes up as the energy goes up. All right? Now, this is the truth for bulk solids. So everything that I'm saying here is bulk solid land. Okay, so the density of states function describes the energy states that are available at each energy. Now, just like in the apartment building, those states may or may not be occupied at any given time, right? Like maybe the apartment's not rented, people go out, they're not inside the apartment. Okay, this is the same kind of thing. Just because the state is there doesn't mean it has to be occupied by an electron. So to know about the occupied energy state, like which states are actually being occupied by electrons or which apartments have people in them, we have to then multiply our density of states by the Fermi-Dirac distribution function, which we introduced in a previous lecture on Fermi energy. So there I'm going to multiply my density of states, d of s times d of s, d sub s of e, times my Fermi-Dirac distribution function, which earlier I called f of e. So if I multiply those two things together, I get 8 pi over h cubed, m to the 3 half, square root of 2 times the energy, times the Fermi-Dirac distribution function, 1 over e to the energy minus the Fermi energy over kt, plus 1. So that was our Fermi-Dirac distribution function. If we do that, right, the Fermi-Dirac distribution function tells us about how the um, electrons are distributed, and the density of states tells us about how the... Um, how the states are distributed. So multiplying those two things together should give us some information about the electrons in those states. Okay, so you're thinking to yourselves, okay, she's made a lot of work here. She's done a lot of work for herself, but I'm not really sure what the heck you could use this density of states for anyway. Fair enough. All right, so first of all, this goes back to statistics, right? If you know what the density of states is, then you can integrate it to find the total number of particles per unit volume, okay? 
Now, the volume here, remember, would be L cubed because we're confining it in uh, size L, right? Now, remember that for that um, Fermi Dirac distribution function, as you approached 0 Kelvin, what happened was up to the Fermi energy, the uh, distribution function was 1. And then after the Fermi energy, the distribution function was 0. Okay, that was only at zero Kelvin though. At other temperatures, it looked more rounded off. Okay, but at zero Kelvin, it looks like a step function. So you can get the total number of particles per unit volume if you're at zero Kelvin by just integrating the density of states because the distribution function is one anyway. So you are multiplying by the distribution function, but it's one or zero, and so it's fine. Now, if it's zero after the Fermi energy, there's no point integrating past the Fermi energy, in, in, is there? So n over L cubed at t is equal to zero is the integral from zero to the Fermi energy of the density of states, period. Okay, so now if you're above t equals zero, if you're at some temperature above absolute zero, then you have to perform the full integration of the Fermi-Dirac distribution function f of e times the density of states from zero to infinity in energy in order to account for all the number of particles per unit volume. All right, so there you go. So that's one thing that the density of states is good for. Other applications of the density of states, there's certain properties of materials that can be described by the density of states. That's a little more than I would like to get into in this particular lecture, but you can talk about um, finding the magnetic susceptibility or maybe the specific heat of conductors at low temperatures. And then you can also find some electrical properties, relationships to describe electrical properties of semiconductors and superconductors using this density of states function. So it has other uses beyond the scope of this lecture. Um, but I hope that in this lecture, you understand a little bit about what the density of states is. Uh, remember that it's the number of states per unit volume, per unit energy in a solid material, right? And that you also uh, see where it comes from. Okay, that's all for now, and let me know if you have any questions. I'll see you in class.